Uh, so you guys are super, super lucky. Uh, it's great to see my Ipscon colleagues, Katie and Rachel over there. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about um, this book. It's a really terrific book. And uh, I'll say a couple things about it. Um, we're launching into some questions. Uh, it takes a really, really good writer to make a book about Euro missiles engaging, right? And exciting. Because this is a really important topic. It's the kind of thing that sort of nerds like me love, but I couldn't put it down, right? This was really, really well done. There's a lot of technical details in this whole thing. And there's a reason why this story, which is of fundamental importance to understanding um, how the Cold War unfolded. And Susie does an amazing job of putting together an extraordinary um, uh, narrative. And I had the pleasure of reading it twice. I read it as a reviewer for Cornell, loved it, said publish it. And to my great excitement and pleasure, she does what did what no one ever does, which is actually took suggestions. <laughs> I was marking like, oh, she did actually write the answer for it. Because I never do that. <laughs> you usually write back to the press and say, oh, these are great suggestions. Yeah. And you know, you know, then you just ignore them, right? Right in the shredder. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's a terrific book, and I, it, if it's okay with you, I wanted to sort of just highlight five big themes that I saw and give you a chance to react, and we can pick which of those, and then there might be things that you want to highlight in it, but why I think this is such a signal important contribution. Um, the first thing is you do this extraordinary job of the dynamics of alliance, right? As I was reading this book, it reminded me how weird NATO is, right? NATO is an unusual entity, and Susie really captures the complexity of it. And given that NATO is obviously very much in the news now, very much something that we're all thinking about, we kind of take it for granted. And um, Susie makes you realize that you can't take it for granted, that it's a very unusual and consequential um, arrangement that throughout, no one expected to keep going. You capture that sense of crisis. This is the year it's over. No, this is the year it's over. No, this is the year it's over. Every year, anyone who can make the Harmel report <laughs> exciting and give a sense of suspense, uh, you do that super well. So, I, 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 you know, we could talk um, more about um, that. And a side note of that is we think of NATO as largely being oriented just against the Soviet Union, but as Susie captures, it's far more than that, right? We have NATO now, we don't have the Soviet Union. And there's, we all know Lord Ismay's famous quote, NATO being about keeping the Soviets out, the Germans down, the Americans in. But there's a real, it's just very, very interesting to, to, um, to reread and to the way Susie presents the complexity and the nuances of this. Uh, second thing, and I think this is really important, and very relevant for today, and I think why you should all read, you may not care about NATO in the 70s or 80s, but this is very relevant to what's going on today. And that is the challenges of having a nuclear-based strategy. Um, the book lays out very clearly why NATO adopted a strategy that was so reliant on nuclear weapons. So it's these overwhelming conventional forces. Uh, Western Europe was recovering. They didn't want to spend the money. The US had nuclear advantages. Then at a certain point, all the circumstances that underpin that nuclear strategy were thrown for a loop, right? And this created an enormous sense of what do we do, right? And as comes out again and again in the book, um, it's just not, a, it's, it's an incredible strategy to threaten nuclear devastation like this, right? And again, this is something we're also thinking about today. Um, the third big theme that I love is the, dilemma of detente and confrontation, the iron law of alliances. If your adversary starts being nice, your alliance unravels. But even more of a dilemma that you show is that, and I kept wondering when I was reading it, there's both, both this desire for stability, this desire for parity, but neither side actually, when there was an opportunity to exploit for advantage, being able to hold back, right? Which is an actual interesting reflection on the nature of international politics. So I'd love to hear more about that. Or seeing the role of the public, um, big, big thing. It's hard to imagine 
now that obscure debates over the neutron bomb or the placement of medium range ballistic missiles in Western Europe could bring out hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people into the streets. Uh, in, I think actually, I don't, I, I can't remember if you mentioned this, but that we did not until the war in Iraq, but even then I think these crowds were larger, right? I mean, it, uh, in, in London, Paris, it's just extraordinary. Um, and yet, the political leaders of the major Western countries, um, uh, Cold in West Germany, Thatcher in Great Britain, and really, most surprisingly, interestingly, Mitterrand in France, standing up to this and making the decision to move forward. Fascinating dynamics. Love to hear more about that. Then finally, something that you point out that I don't think a lot of people pick up on that's really important, that we all... And this is, this is where being a historian is really important. Um, this story all worked out well. It wasn't necessarily the case that it would have worked out. And in fact, the actual, we all think, we think of this story, we'll track decision, we're gonna put these missiles in and we're gonna negotiate. Oh, it's a success. The missiles are gone. It was a crisis, right? And you know, the namesake of my center went on, as you know, a rampage writing with his former boss, President Nixon, actually lobbying and willing to go to book on Reagan highlights this. And they were furious saying, this is going to be a disaster for Europe because of decoupling, right? And then the Cold War ends. But as you show, it's like, it wasn't neat, it wasn't tidy, it didn't solve all the problems. So anyway, those are the potpourri, great things, <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what, what of those do you, would you like to sort of talk about or elaborate on, or did I get wrong? Or no, do you I, want to add? I, I think maybe we can start with NATO since it's the center of the book. And I think one of the fundamental things that I wanted to put across in writing the book is that if you were to land on the planet Earth in 1949, uh, you're, you're a Martian, you survey the landscape, you want to make an alliance, you would never pick NATO. The structure, the geography of NATO is nothing that you want. You would never want your most powerful ally, the one most capable of providing defense, the furthest from the front line. Nearly all of NATO's problems during the Cold War and some of NATO's problems now come back to that problem, right? You have this incredibly powerful ally, the furthest from the front lines, and everybody, large, medium-sized, you know, NATO's got all, all types and sizes of powers, wants protection from the United States. So the United States needs to figure out how it is going to project that power and do so in a way that makes all of those powers, large and small, feel like it is actually going to provide them security. That's not a very enviable task. And so time and again in the book, uh, and one of the things I struggled with the most as a writer is how do you write about things that keep happening over and over and over and over again without making your reader feel as though they are either having deja vu or maybe they, you know, the book got reprinted with some pages stuffed in the middle, you know, print on demand has those problems these days. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you, how do you tell a story that is constantly recurring in ways that emphasize that these problems are always going on, but don't put your reader to sleep in the process. Uh, and so I think for me, that, that struggle really took me to what was the one incredibly simple intervention in the existing histories of this that I wanted to make, which is nearly everybody calls this episode the Euro Missiles Crisis. And I decided I was never going to use that term because it's impossible. What is the crisis? There are like 35 different crises. <laughs> I mean, you have a crisis over whether extended deterrence is going to work. How oh, well, about you have 20 crises over whether extended deterrence is going to work. You have uh, crises about whether the United States can be trusted to defend Europe. Is that defense going to be with nuclear weapons? Well, the prospect of the United States firing off nuclear weapons causes some crises of its own. Needless to say, some people, when they dwell on that thought, don't actually like the idea of a nuclear war uh, to protect them. 
you have crises about whether the West Germans are going to be dependable allies, or are they going to decide that they want to go off with the Soviet Union or flirt with neutralism and abandon the alliance. You have just tons and tons and tons of crises. There's a remarkable period in 1983 where, so the alliance had made this decision in 1979, this dual track decision that Frank referred to. And so the basic structure of this decision is, on one hand, the alliance is going to introduce new ground-based missiles in Western Europe for the first time since 1963. They have removed the last ground-based ones in this class after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they're going to reintroduce these, these missiles. There's two, two types of missile, the Pershing-2 and the ground-launched cruise missile. The other piece of that decision, hence the dual track, is that they're going to pursue arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union on those same systems at the same time, right? The Soviet Union had already started deploying its own missiles, the SS-20s, and so they're going to try and get rid of the SS-20s or reduce the SS-20s. And this decision has a crazy long time delay. They, NATO decides this in December 1979, but they're not going to start deploying until 1983, which is like a colossally stupid strategic move, which maybe we can talk about just like how easily exploited that was. But so you have this period where they're trying to keep everyone who is going to host the missiles in step. So in this 1979 decision, they had planned to put missiles in five different countries, the United Kingdom, the Federal Republic of Germany, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Belgium and the Netherlands already, as soon as they make the decision, it's basically clear they're not going to accept the missiles, at least not on time. They're a little all over the place. So you're down to these three, Italy, the United Kingdom, and the Federal Republic of Germany. So why do I harp on this? Because the critical piece for the West Germans was that they would not be alone in accepting nuclear weapons. And so the Germans, in a classic German turn of phrase, refer to this as singularization. It's a very ugly and clunky word, but right, they just didn't want to be alone. In doing this. But in order to not be singularized, see, it's really hard to write about this stuff and have it sound good uh, when, when your people are using terrible terminology like this. So in order to not have Germany be singularized, they it's not enough for the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom is already a nuclear power. They have an at least notionally independent nuclear program. So they want a non-nuclear ally on the continent. So you end up in this crazy situation where you need to rely on Italian domestic politics working. <laughs> Anybody who knows anything about the post-1945 world might know that that's a really bad bet. I wouldn't take those odds. And so you have this remarkable story where you have allies who, of medium size, the Italians probably would have been mad at me saying that about them, but it's true. Uh, where, where it really all comes down to, to that. And it goes to show that NATO is just so complicated. I, I think the, the biggest thing that I wanted someone to take away from the book about NATO, especially American readers, is we often, if you pick up a newspaper, you turn on the TV and somebody's talking about NATO, I would bet you money that they are going to use the phrase, the US-led alliance, as though NATO is just an extension of US foreign policy and what Washington says goes. Now this coexists alongside a really uh, a, an argument that puts forward the exact opposite interpretation during the Cold War, right, which is that the Warsaw Pact is a Soviet-led dominated institution where uh, all of the smaller members of the Warsaw Pact have no say, not a true reflection of the Warsaw Pact either, but that, and that NATO is an, an unruly set of democracies. But yet when we write about NATO, all too often people just write about it as though it's the United States. And when Washington says jump, the allies all respond, how hot. I'll, I will leave it there for now. I, it's great stuff. A couple threads I want to pull on. And one thing I was thinking of is reading the book that you've just highlighted is this constant set of crisis. And if you came down from Mars, you would never see the great this. And so from a standpoint, I kept trying to think of the counterfactuals, like in two ways. One, how close was it to unraveling? And because 
every year and every page there's it's about to unravel and two there's a certain if one of the problems with it all working out is a certain retrospective outcome bias right and and i guess what i'm wondering is was there a point where you when you're looking at the document you felt all right things really this could unravel and then after that what would be the consequences of that unravel? right like so you know, what would be would alter again as you know nato was not the first choice of the original post-war defense plans it was kind of cobbled together in a very strange way so how close what would have happened and might things have looked different yeah, it's, it's the hardest question to answer, as, especially as a historian, right? You want to go where the documents take you I, and, and figuring out something that is such an emotionally charged question, right? A lot of the assessments that are at play here, but whether NATO is going to fall apart, some of it is journalistic flourish, right? It's easier to sell newspapers about an alliance in crisis, even if it's always in crisis. Uh, but, but some of it is about then the nuts and bolts of the assessment. And so I think paradoxically, there are many times when NATO is on the rocks, when things look bad, but the time that is the most alarming and when it seems the most, the most fragile is in the spring of 1989, which may That's sound really crazy, right? We know what happens in the summer of 1989, in the fall of 1989. We know the Berlin Wall is going to come down. But in the spring of 1989, NATO policymakers have no clue. They have some inklings that things are starting to change in, in Eastern Europe. They have some inklings that things are starting to change in the Soviet Union, that maybe Glasnost and Perestroika, right, the flagship programs of Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet Union, are starting to really change the country, maybe unleash some forces uh, within an imperial structure that are not exactly going to work for state stability. But in the spring of 1989, NATO's policymakers are primarily obsessed with their own problems. They are preparing for a summit in May of 1989 to celebrate NATO's 40th anniversary, right? It's been first signed the treaty in April of 1949. So they have a May summit scheduled to celebrate 40 years as an alliance. And as they are approaching that date, they are completely divided over the question of whether or not they will modernize another set of missiles, this time short range nuclear forces. So these are uh, weapons designed primarily for battlefield use, range under 500 kilometers, but most importantly, and at least technically for our purposes, these were ones that had not been done away with by the INF Treaty in December, 1987, right? So the INF Treaty had gotten rid of this whole swath of missiles, with a range from 500 to 5,500 kilometers, but these pesky short range ones are still there. And in 1983, NATO had begun to move towards a plan for modernization, right? The existing missiles deployed in this class were starting to age out. They were planning to introduce a new set of missiles, particularly the follow on to the lands. But this becomes, after the INF Treaty is signed, it becomes this huge lightning rod over nearly everything about NATO's strategy, because there is, the whole strategy is based on this idea of flexible response. And I got the expert here, so we can talk a little bit about how flexible response does and does not work. But the idea is that you're going to gradually escalate through a chain of options. That's the general idea. Nobody agreed about much beyond that general idea. When you remove this class of missiles with the INF Treaty in the middle, everybody starts to worry about how escalation is going to happen. Are you going to be able to escalate? Is extended deterrence going to work? Is the strategy going to actually provide the kind of deterrent protection that everybody is hoping that it does? But if we come back to that missile range, 500 kilometers, you think about Cold War Europe. You have two blocks, you have a Germany divided, you're going to deploy missiles with a range that short. Where are you deploying them? Along the line. Along the line, in the Federal Republic of Germany, probably. The Germans just told you, right? Singularization. I'm sure you didn't forget that beautifully <laughs> clunky word. The Germans figure out very quickly that modernizing these weapons is probably going to fall primarily on them. 
they will be singularized unless they can convince Turkey or someone to maybe take a view, which is a fraught problem. And so German politics become divided. You have intra-party divide, you have opposition politicians, you have religious groups, you have a rekindling of some of the earlier anti-nuclear activism from earlier in the decade. And really clustered around this idea that this was a uniquely German problem. The, the morbid slogan that many of them used was the shorter the range, the deader the German. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that really sums up the nature of the problem. And so there is so much West German resistance to modernization that US policymakers and British policymakers in particular worry in very different ways that the West Germans might be willing to strike it out on their own, that they're gonna to try to renegotiate their relationship with the Soviet Union, that they're gonna drift away from doing what is in the Alliance's best interest. Margaret Thatcher is furious because in part, because she feels that this is uh, going to diminish Britain's stature within the alliance. And the Americans are concerned that it's going to remake the entire post-war contract uh, in Europe. Brent Scowcroft, who was uh, George Bush's national security advisor at the time, writes a memo in the summer of 1989 after this summit, barely papers over the problem, saying the biggest geopolitical problem that we will face in the 1990s is the Federal Republic of Germany. And then the sentence goes on unless the Soviet Union collapses. It is that contingency that saves the alliance. Uh, the, the most compelling metaphor I found was Gregory Treverton, who had worked in the Carter administration on these issues, uh, described the entire Cold War as a race to the bottom, right? That it was just a question of whose side was going to unravel first. And in the end, it was the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union that unraveled. But that moment in the spring of 1989 is not good. So I, there are two parts of that that I want to ask you about. You can take it in either order you want. Um, I mean, that part, that story, I don't think is really widely known and really comes out vividly. But the politics of Germany and the so-called German question, which are a part of a lot of this, and is often forgotten, right? Um, and that's one of the dilemmas throughout your book and throughout this period. Another dilemma, maybe start, we'll start on this one, is that the great irony was that as the US and the Soviets moved to achieve strategic stability, and you talk about this through SALT and ABM, and actually try to reduce the dangers that come about from a potential strategic nuclear exchange, that you generate the tensions that create the crisis in Western Europe because it appears to be coupled. So maybe you could explain, because that's a logic that few people really understand. Well, assault, maybe yeah, it's like mom out buying baseball, or, but it is what generates <laughs> the crisis, yeah. right? Yeah. And and by the way, you've got that nice line in there too about um, uh, uh, about Brezhnev getting in trouble for strategic stability on his side as well, yeah. where his generals are like. What the hell are you doing here? This is this is causing problems for us. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that dynamic because it's so, if not counterintuitive, not known, but it, it's at the heart of a lot of the crisis you talk about. Yeah. So I think you have a you have a fundamental problem about how how nuclear weapons fit in the way you envision the world working, right? So how is it going to underpin your strategy? For the United States, you have a system that as we've already covered, at least in passing, is sort of cobbled together to meet uh, urgent situations. It's cobbled together at a period where the United States has an overwhelming amount of superiority. And so superiority forms the glue. It's the foundation of much of the way US nuclear strategy and the alliance's nuclear strategy uh, as a result functions. The problem is, how do you preserve superiority forever? Is it politically desirable to preserve superiority forever? This becomes one of the critical debates about arms control, right? Do you want to stabilize the Cold War? You want to reduce tensions. You maybe want to get an agreement with the Soviet Union. But in order to get an agreement with the Soviet Union, you need to offer them some kinds of kind of terms that are going to be attractive. Uh, and so 
you have a move towards ideas of strategic stability that you're going to accept a sort of shared equal ceilings kind of approach where you balance the arsenals on both sides. But then that takes us back to the alliance problems. You want to extend deterrence from the United States out all the way to the Fulda Gap and across West Germany. How do West Germans, who, by the way, you have told that they can't have an atomic, biological, or chemical weapons program, that they need to depend on you and NATO for their protection, how can you give them enough confidence that it's going to work? They're going to want some things that are not just based in North Dakota. They're going to want some things that are based a little bit closer to home. And so you have this big problem when the superpowers start to talk about arms control in the late 1960s, uh, what becomes the strategic arms limitation tax or so, where the Nixon administration undertakes all of these consultations within the alliance about what they are going to call a strategic weapon. Right? This is something we forget about arms control, that a lot these are all just defined, right? As part of the negotiations, they the United States, the Soviet Union, they are talking about how they are going to lump weapons together. What is an apple and what is a similar kind of apple? What's an apple and what's an orange? Are you going to have an agreement that is a fruit salad or is it going to be apples only? Right? These are the kinds of problems that they are dealing with. And so in the early negotiations about salt, they are trying to figure out what is going to happen with weapons that are medium range and in Europe. The Soviet Union has a set of SS-4s and SS-5s, medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles that are targeting the capitals of Western Europe. The United States has no ground-based systems, but they have a whole series of air uh, and sea launched systems. And so they have this debate about, are you going to include them? Are you not? The Soviets want these forward-based systems, the air and, and sea launch systems I just referred to, included as strategic weapons because they can strike the Soviet Union. The Allies want the United States to get the Soviet medium range systems included, but don't want to give away the forward-based systems because it's their protection. And so ultimately, in order to get an agreement, they don't include either of them. They focus solely on US weapons that can strike the Soviet Union, Soviet weapons that can strike the United States. So you leave this whole class of stuff undealt with. Well, big surprise, then the West Germans, the Brits, the French, the Italians, they all go, so you stabilized at one level, now what does that do to us? We're a little bit less safe now than we were before. And the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, the Carter administration are all trying to say, no, 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 it's fine. You're just as safe as you were before. And in that period, the Soviet Union modernizes it's a uh, medium range systems, right? Replaces some of these SS4s and SS5s with the SS20s, which are more powerful. They don't blow up as frequently on the launch pad because they're not relying on liquid fuel. And, and that accelerates the conversation. So you do have this puzzle about how does strategic stability and getting a deal that works for the superpowers fit in the alliance dynamic. And, and they don't really work together. You're just constantly trying to balance where you take your losses. How did you come to think about, I mean, this is something anyone who looks at this question has to wrestle with, the idea that these weapons are ultimately unusable, right? I mean, everybody knows that Kissinger comes out as a movie's audience, that often gives a speech in Europe and basically says, yeah, we were never going to use them. Um, yet, <laughs> there's also, and I, I want to get to the US part in a second, but I want to just focus on and this gets to the whole dilemma of nuclear strategy, right? And how did you, because this was, these were enormously consequential political decisions. Governments could have risen and fall over them. Strategies were embraced that were highly forward leaning and risk accepted. Extraordinary amount of money to spend. Um, but you could flip it around and say, but you know, and you have a couple, you know, times where American policymakers on the Europeans, you're safe as you ever were, right? Like these questions don't sort of matter. Matter. How do you, I mean? How should, especially for you know, we're thinking about this today, right? How did you come to think about 
nuclear strategy and its connection to political outcomes. Does that make sense? Yeah. I because think, at a certain level, this is like all kabuki theater, right? Like, oh, entirely. But on the other hand, it's as real as you can get, right? So, and I'm just wondering how you, how you came to think about that dynamic. I would say that 99% of nuclear strategy in the NATO context is about politics. It's not actually about how you're going to use the weapons. It's not actually all of, all of those decisions, things about posture, things about modernization, things about investment. Uh, procurement, R&D, I mean, start at the beginning of the, the nuclear weapons life cycle and take it to the end. Every single piece of that puzzle is about politics. Some of it is about inter-service rivalry. Uh, some of it is about the politics between a producer and a host nation. Uh, some of it is about the politics of, you know, how do superpower relations look at a time when you are thinking, what does forecasting look like, trending, strategic assessment about where the Soviet Union will be. All of this is political in some ways. I think the, the critical thing in the NATO context is that NATO strategy makes sense unless you think about it. <laughs> it worked beautifully if you never ever opened the box, right? It was, it was designed to be clear enough to provide reassurance, but ambiguous enough to keep six or seven different interpretations in one uh, strategy consistent. So you have US policymakers who are talking about war fighting uses of nuclear weapons, and the Germans convinced that any war in Europe is a complete disaster. And the only thing that they will ever contemplate is that there will be no war in Europe. That's the only available option for the Germans. Can't be conventional, can't be nuclear, just can't happen. And, but those logics take US policymakers and West German policymakers to the same place, which is an incredibly forward leaning, risky strategy where you're going to threaten a lot. You're going to threaten a huge amount of destruction because you have a degree of confidence or maybe a degree of faith. I think there's an almost religious element here, right? A degree of faith that it's going to work. And so, what happens, a huge part of the story that I tell, right, is that as more people become exposed to those assumptions, more and more people go, I don't like that. That is not reassuring. That is not comforting. You're telling me that the best chance we have to not blow up the world is to make more effective weapons that can be fired more quickly with more automation, with more firepower. And we're just supposed to assume that because it has always worked, it's going to keep working. And so you have tons of people that I talk about in the book who reject that. Uh, some of them are activists who decide to go out into the streets with you know, placards calling for arms control talks, asking their governments to leave NATO. You have Ronald Reagan, a man who objects deeply to the logic of nuclear deterrence, right? Part of the reason the Strategic Defense Initiative, the like total boondoggle that he uh, is enamored of about how you're gonna like shoot lasers out of the sky and all of these things, I go some pretty fanciful drawings. It is because Reagan thinks about deterrence and goes, that's not, that's not enough. I wanna, well, we should save this for the end because I, I, that, I think you beautifully captured it makes sense unless you think about it and some of this persists to today and some of our friends are involved in writing these things and so i i i, I, you know, I, I there is a question of how sustainable a kind of a, an, a creative fiction like that is and whether you want to have a policy based on that but before getting to that i want to you've talked a lot about how the european partners look at this but nato was odd for the united states Right. And so the United States, the whole tradition of American foreign policies never enter into any peacetime alliance, they never make it permanent. And um, certainly not with Europeans. In fact, I've always, and this comes out beautifully in the book, but whenever people even use the term alliance, it's, a, it's not an alliance. Alliances are supposed to be temporary, they're supposed to be additive, not suppressive, right? They're supposed to be threat specific. 
this is none of this, right? NATO still exists, even though those right away, went away. It's large, as you, you hinted at earlier, the large part of it is to make sure the Germans don't get nuclear weapons, right? And you know, it seems to be going on forever, right? And that flies in the face of up till this point, you know, a century and a half, almost two centuries of American foreign policy. And so, and there's hints of this, right? You know, Taft, President 52 running against NATO. You talk a lot about the Mansfield Amendment of pulling troops out. Um, tell me a little bit about how you can, and, and, and you can see this too in the Carter administration when you start talking about it, and, and, and this frustration a lot of American policymakers have thought in Europeans of why are you constantly wanting to be reassured? What is this all about? Like, you know, we're exposing ourselves here, right? For, as you said early on, for this continent way far away. How did you come to think about how the United States thought about its own role in this weird group, right? Because as we saw with the Trump presidency, right, there, there is an important constituency. It is constituency. It is not irrational for people in the United States to say, what is this? What are we doing? Why? Why? So how did you come to think about the way the United States thought about it during this, this period? Yeah, I mean, you, I, I think it's not an exaggeration. There's a famous historian, probably the most prolific historian of NATO, Lawrence Kaplan, who described signing the North Atlantic Treaty as the revolution of 1949, right? A true remaking of the American foreign policy tradition in many respects. And I think we have antecedents, right? You can see a sort of growing US interest in uh, protection in the Western Hemisphere. You think about the agreements signed in 1939 or 1940 with the Canadians. Um, the expansion of the Monroe Doctrine to cover Greenland and Iceland in World War II. So there are some inklings there. But 1949 is this big change, right? That you're going to make a standing agreement with, you're going to enter an entangling alliance, right? Exactly the thing that George Washington had told Americans to never do. And so you're going to take the Washington advice, you're going to throw it out the window, and you're going to do it. I think you very quickly in NATO's history see a, a tension that we are still living with, which is, you, on one hand, have administrations, Democratic and Republican, who want the allies to do more, who want to be able to draw back from Europe to recalibrate the burden some. I mean, Eisenhower is probably the most famous in the, in the 50s, truly wanting to pare back the, the commitment, but you have plenty of other illustrations of this. But at the same time, not knowing how or not being comfortable with the options to rebuild or reorient the relationship. And so you end up in this situation, which I think will sound familiar to many of you, where it becomes more convenient for American policymakers to complain about how our allies are freeloaders uh, and urge them to do more and then have them say, yes, absolutely, we will do more and then not do more. Try not to come up with bad relationship metaphors here. <laughs> but, but this is, this is the, the thing I always tell people about writing about NATO is it is something of a cross between being a therapist or a marriage counselor. <laughs> Except it's the most complicated marriage in the world because there's so many people in this marriage, right? A Mormon marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even worse. Right, and so you, you have this, so much of, it is impossible to tell the Alliance's history without, you're talking about emotion, psychology. A bunch of it is totally irrational. And some of that is because I'm writing about the prospect of nuclear war, which has its own irrational logic. But some of it is just about how the alliance works, right? Everybody constantly wants to be reassured. And so you have a, a number of different points where American policymakers are both trying to figure out how they can shed some of their burdens and reduce the load, but then they lose a little bit of control over the direction of events, and then they don't like that either. And so sometimes you have administrations who are just trying to, you know, sort of in, a, in an ebb and flow internally of a when and where they're going to re, reassert influence. But some of it is also that other administrations genuinely do want to recalibrate, and then the allies don't want to take on more. So this is the Carter administration story, I think, right? 
you have uh, in, in Brzezinski in particular, somebody who is very realistic about what US power looks like in the 1970s, convinced that multipolarity is coming, convinced that the United States needs to reorient in order to meet the challenges of this multipolar world, wants a more equitable transatlantic relationship. But every time the administration tries to devolve some of the decision making to the Europeans, they get pushed back. They get pushed back because it's too politically contentious at home. It's going to cause problems with the West German coalition government. It has caused. Uh, so this is less marriage, more having teenagers. <laughs> no, a family dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Right? You've got all of them. And so. I want to say, but I don't. I want to really, say, but I don't yeah. want, I want you to be do responsible. Everything for me. But yes, I don't want to yes, be responsible yes. for it. I want to be independent until somebody needs to like do the bad thing. Yes, and then I want yes. you to do the bad thing. And, and that really is, in many ways, the way that it works. And so you have this moment in, in 1978, uh, the, the fall of 1978 and early 1979, when they're really starting to come together in the Carter administration around the ideas that will be the dual track decision. So, so deployment and arms control. And they're trying to figure out, can you do one and not do the other? And, and they conclude they got to do both. They also do a whole bunch of soul searching about whether or not they can offload some of the responsibility of leading the alliance into this decision onto someone else. And they run through, there's a great memo that Jim Rentschler writes in May of 1979, running through the options. And it's basically like, well, we can't devolve any power to the West Germans because then everybody will freak out that the West Germans are too powerful. The French are really weird and they don't like anything to do with NATO, so we definitely can't ask the French to do anything. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher has just been elected, and the British economy is a train wreck, so we could ask her to do a little bit, but it probably wouldn't work very well. And then we're down to all the small and mid middle powers, and what are we going to ask them to do? So whether we like it or not, we're the ones who have to do it. And this is from an administration that is the most open, probably, of all the administrations <laughs> I write about, to recalibrating. And even they come down and say, look, we might want to change the way it works, but we can't. Uh, in the Reagan administration, that is a source of a lot of resentment. Uh, only some of that comes out in the story I write here about the air missiles. But if you look at the Siberian pipeline in 1982, I mean, you have conservative commentators in the press constantly saying, why do we have half a million troops in Europe? Because these guys are all freeloaders who won't do anything. All they want to do is trade with the Soviets anyway. And then we're going to have to come bail them out when the so Soviets blackmail them. I, I want to open this up to questions and others, but this there's two questions I have, and I, I might as well go the second one. I was going to ask you about, and you can choose which one you want to do. One is about, there's an extraordinary story in here about public pressure and protest um, uh, and the role it plays. Normally, people who, like us, study high politics, we don't really know what to think about that. Or, you know, our friend Mary Sorority is excellent on this in, in her work. So explaining a little bit about the dynamics of the time of how this seemingly technical and obscure set of issues about nuclear strategy touched such a nerve and generated such um, kind of public fervor. Why don't, why don't I tell, because I think that's really interesting and unlike, you don't usually see this in kind of big geopolitical or nuclear strategy. No, I think you, you have this incredible constellation that happens in the politics of the early 1980s. Some of it is total coincidence. Uh, some of it is long simmering frustration. But you have this moment in the early 1980s where NATO takes the dual track decision in December 1979. Two weeks later, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. And so relations between the United States and the Soviet Union had been rocky in the late 1970s, uh, had certainly been trending negatively. And then December 1979 happens, and it just looks like a nosedive. Uh, and people start to panic, right? Detente is dead. It is going to be the end of this era of relative peace and security in Europe. It seems suddenly like the Cold War is coming back in full force, and NATO is going to install new nuclear missiles. So really, you know, you're going to get new, new explosive neighbors. It, it seems quite dangerous. And so if you take a cursory look at the popular culture of the 1980s, the early 1980s, there are nuclear weapons going off everywhere. 
war games, right? You have a, a plot entirely based around how Matthew Broderick's character stumbles his way in a computer game into actually fighting a war game with a nuclear arsenal. It's you, loosely based on Peter Peter's early life. So, <laughs> <laughs> so happy we'll have to bring our That's copy of the draft by Peter. We, you have the day after, where uh, NATO and the Warsaw Pact exchange nuclear strikes and parts of Kansas are obliterated. It's still like the most watched show ever. Yeah, it? yeah, and it's huge. It's such a media event when it comes out in 1983. They assemble an all-star panel. Henry Kissinger is there. Eli Wiesel is there. George Schultz, who's the sitting secretary of state, is there. And they do this manual on how <laughs> nuclear war is not as scary as you think, and it's definitely not going to happen. Uh, and so you have this, I mean, and it's everywhere. It's, uh, if you know the Sting song, Russians, I hope the Russians love their children too. That's a 1985 classic. 99 Red Balloons in English and German, chart top we're in both. Uh, the James Bond movie that comes out in 1981, the premise is that they foil a rogue Soviet general who has a nuclear bomb, right? You have constant, constant messaging that maybe the superpowers relations aren't so bad that nuclear war will happen. But maybe it'll happen just by accident because these weapons are so technologically advanced. Uh, and, and there are real world events that mirror and emphasize that, right? You have the, the shoot down of the Korean airliner in September of 1983, where Soviet air defenses take down a passenger aircraft killing a congressman and all 269 passengers on board. And so you have this, this really emotional sense. And then all of the contours of the issue tap into frustrations people have with the post-war order, right? Some people feel like the Cold War sucks up too much energy, right? That it would be better to spend the money put in a nuclear weapons on healthcare, the developing world, education. You have people who believe deterrence is fundamentally amoral and against their religious beliefs. You have people who object to what they see as a totally masculine industry. Helen Caldicott, who is a, a physician by training and is a famous Australian disarmament campaigner, writes a whole book called Missile Envy, which is basically just about how everything in the nuclear weapons complex is incredibly phallic and men are the problem. Uh, and so, <laughs> so you have lots of different lines of argument that come together. And the last one I would flag is just an overwhelming sense of frustration with how dominant the United States is. And Reagan in particular becomes a good avatar for those fears. People worry that he's aggressive and bombastic, but he's a nuclear cowboy. I looked through so many amazing photographs of people uh, who made like giant seven foot tall paper mache Ronald Reagan's riding a missile. Um, and it, it became like, that was the sort of <coughs> imagery uh, that was used. So you, you have this remarkable moment where because it taps into so many bigger and more accessible issues that people become conversant in nuclear strategy so that they can contest all these other things about the Cold War order. So my final question, and that is, um, you mentioned a concern about kind of a greedy, irresponsible Europeans just using gas from the East while the United States mm -hmm. takes on a variety of security burdens against. And uh, I don't want to be conspiratorial and say that the fact that, that we've had another European missile crisis the day your book was released, um, I, since you told me earlier that our book is sold out. For, for this reason, um, but any sort of parallels or comments? I mean, again, one of the big themes of this book is is how NATO, despite it all, despite its strangeness, despite its odd construction, um, persists. And now we're in a period. It's only two or three years ago that Macron called. You know, brain dead, there was a sense of drift, Trump had attacked it. Now it seems as if it's once again sort of reinvigorated. Any lessons from your story to help everyone here understand and think about you know, current dynamics, dynamics, both in terms of uh, the Russia-Ukraine war and NATO's response? Yeah, I think there's, there's two pieces of this history that I think inform or help contextualize what we're looking at in the present. 
The first is that the best thing to have happened to NATO this year is Vladimir Putin. I mean, NATO is 100% in a better situation than it was in December of last year or January of this year because a, a year, two, three years ago, it was easy to focus on burden sharing questions, whether or not Trump was right when he called NATO obsolete, whether Macron was onto something when he called it brain dead. Putin wiped so much of that conversation out, right? The best case for NATO has always been made in Moscow. And so Putin <laughs> follows a time honored tradition there, right? I mean, some of the moments that I talk about in the book where uh, things look bad for NATO, it's because the Soviet Union, lo Union looks nice. Right, things look pretty good in the early 1970s when Nixon and Brezhnev are meeting for summits. Things look pretty good when Gorbachev is out talking about a common European home. Things look less good when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. Things look less good when Russia invades Ukraine. Right, and so, so I, I think there is a is a parallel there that we're seeing a sort of the latest installation of a long story about how the, the you know Moscow has been a a really good salesperson for NATO. The other piece of the puzzle is I think that this history can tell us a lot about why we are so frustrated with the Germans. You see a lot of ambiguous press coverage about whether or not the Germans should do more. Uh, you may have seen right, talk about the Zeitenwende, the much lauded and never to be seen again Zeitenwende, right, this fundamental change in German foreign policy that was going to be more engaged I think there's a lot of ambigu like ambiguity and ambiguous feeling around that because we both, and I, I use we as nearly everybody else in the alliance, we both want the Germans to do more because they are big and they have money, but we also don't really want them to do more because we're not always confident that they're going to go in the direction we want them to go. And so you can see a lot of the assessments of, of Chancellor Schultz and, you know, is trade with Russia a good thing that much of what the Germans say on this question causes a lot of anxiety, right? That, that there seems to be still a large constituency in Germany that is interested in protecting trade relations with Russia at nearly any cost, right? And, and that has long roots, right? That about sort of what the nature of that German uh, Soviet then Russian relationship looks like. And I think we often don't like to talk about it because it was the unspoken piece. It was, everyone in the Cold War knew that that's what it was about and so no one talked about it unless they had to. But now, because those assumptions were not surfaced very often, we've sort of conveniently forgotten them. And so I, I think one of the things I really wanted to do in the book was to I didn't really want to write a book for people who had lived through the Euro missiles, uh, people who had gone to protest and or had debated it around their kitchen table. I wanted to write it for a generation of people who have no clue that this ever happened uh, because it, it can tell us a lot about why the Cold War ended the way that it did and why we inherited a world in which we kept NATO and, and it expanded. Uh, and, and I, Often we tell that history starting in 1989, but I think there's a much, much longer story here uh, that dates back to the Alliance's founding, uh, but, but really it's almost impossible to explain 1989 without explaining the experience of the 1980s. Uh, I know the political scientists in the room will laugh because this is a historian trope that everything has an earlier origin than you could ever imagine. Well, I do write about this in the conclusion, right, that I have paid all my professional dues because I have confirmed every stereotype of a historian. But in this case, <laughs> in this case, I do think that it is nearly impossible to explain. Right? People always ask this question. Why did NATO survive the end of the Cold War? Its function was done. Why didn't you close up shop? Because they didn't know the Cold War was over. They didn't know the Cold War was going to be over forever. They had lived through the 1970s when they thought the Cold War might end, and then it came back. And so they were not at all eager after working so hard to keep this alliance functioning in the 1980s to then say, oh, great, thanks, we'll pack it up, we'll go home. And so of course they kept it because it was an insurance policy. Your house might catch on fire, you might have a flood, you needed it there. And, and it's that logic that forms the foundations for NATO's expansion. And of course, an immense demand for security from the Central and Eastern European countries who are eager to escape the clutches of one scandal.
Excellent. Great stuff. Why don't we uh, open it up? Um, questions from the uh, audience? I'm curious. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. So just, just because you talked about kind of how some of the similar thinking in the Euro missiles crisis would perform the role of legitimizing the expansion of NATO. I was wondering if you can expand on that thread a little bit and how kind of the sort of thinking and patchworks that you described, like it seems like bringing more partners into this marriage might not be the best, the best idea to make it more functional. Can you just talk a little bit more about how that all played out? Yeah, so you have, so in the 1980s, right, you have a, a series of inc incredibly close run crises uh, basically one after another, right? It's not new, but it is the story of, of the alliance in the 1980s. And you have an alliance that is desperate to make the case that it is the best guarantor of peace and security in Europe. They invest a lot in trying to put across to their publics that nuclear deterrence might seem insane, but it is still the best option we've got. Uh, they come up with these horribly hokey slogans about how NATO is the real peace movement to counter the protesters in the street, you, you have all of this momentum that is built around trying to keep the transatlantic relationship solid. That is all the more acute in the spring of 1989 because of this uh, episode over short range nuclear forces that I talked about a little bit earlier. So on the eve of all of this transformation, sweeping Eastern Europe, sweeping Central Europe, sweeping into the Soviet Union, you have an alliance that is really, really focused on preserving itself. And so you have, it is that mindset that shapes so much of how they approach the diplomacy of 1989 and 1990. And here again is why the Germans are so central to the story. They want to get German unification. One of the ways they convince the Soviet Union to do it is that they are going to keep NATO because the Soviets might not like NATO, but NATO works to keep the Germans from doing all the things that the Germans had done in the past. And that sounds crazy, right? I mean, we think about you know, what our current grievances are with the Germans and it's about not doing enough or having a pacifist tradition. But you have policymakers in the 1980s who are, Margaret Thatcher famously pulls a, map out of her handbag in a meeting with Helmut Kohl that is a map of World War II, right? I mean, this is a woman who has not forgotten the lessons of history. She pulls a group of historians together for a big meeting she, a weekend where they basically, yeah. you know, Norman Stone and they, the Ash, where they just talk about, will, will bad Germany come back? Yeah, and they, all they, the British historians say yes. Yeah, yeah they're, like, they're like, you should worry. Yeah. You know, there is an entire generation that is convinced that there are uh, so it's an extension of thinking that is, I think, best expressed in a memo uh, from the Johnson years uh, where they likened, it's a state INR assessment, I think, where they likened the Germans to alcoholics, right? That uh, you need to keep the Germans away from the bottle, militarism, <laughs> because otherwise, if you let them go back, they would get up to all their bad habits again. And that sounds crazy. But that is exactly the kind of emotionally charged, historically infused. We don't have to agree with their reading of the past, but that's how they read the past. And that shaped the way that they made choices. And so you have then this really interesting moment, 89, 90, where they're trying to get Germany in, uh, in NATO unified. They throw the Soviets a bone by uh, rebranding as a polit more political alliance. They get a flexible response. They talk about how nuclear weapons are uh, or last resort. So fundamental change in the way they frame their mission, purpose, nuclear strategy. And maybe that would have been it. But then the Soviet Union falls apart. And then the whole set of options changes. You have Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland agitating for some sort of security guarantee, right? Also looking to the past and going, I don't want to live between the Germans and, and the Russians and without somebody telling me that they're behind me. And so there's a big debate. I mean, when you look at the records from the 92, 93, 94, not everyone in NATO has agreed that expansion is a good idea. In That's fact, nearly idea. everybody yeah. thinks yeah. it's a terrible idea. But then 
relations change with Russia enough? There's enough pressure from the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Poles, that people start to come around to the idea that, well, this is the best solution we've got to fix this. And it's to your point that you said it's the worst solution except all the others, right? You could have a nuclear Poland, that would take care of all the problems. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. I mean, Poland would have been alive. <laughs> no, I, I don't know anybody wants that. Polish nuclear yeah, weapons. Would you, I mean, I'm sure people in Poland thought well, about but, that. But this, is, but this is an interesting piece of the puzzle, right? So part of, one of the very earliest assessments that the Bush administration, uh, the first Bush administration did about whether or not NATO expansion would be a good idea, 90 or 91, it is that Poles will live with nuclear weapons on their soil. The Germans might not do it forever. We just saw all through the 1980s that they were really unhappy about living on them, but the Poles will take it. And so it's a solution. I mean, look at what's happened in the post-Cold War world. Where does the United States station critical parts of its defense infrastructure? Poland, Romania, right? I mean, we still garrison an incredible number of forces in Germany, but the new members, took on a lot of that burden yeah. and so helped recalibrate much of the balance within the alliance. I had a question. So um, first of all, mentioning how you see pretty the pattern that I'm thinking of is, you know, history repeats itself, let's be honest. We're seeing some sort of patterns and sort of trends with these great power competitions, for example, the PRC, China. Could we say potentially that, you know, from historically seeing the Cold War, Soviet Union, as you said, and I agree with, no one really knew that the Cold War was really over. So can we say and assume today that we are in a Cold War today with the PRC and truly trying to define what integrated deterrence really means? Is deterrence really just a term that we are putting out there where the allied nations are working together as an alliance to be able to have hold that key of peace? Or is deterrence something that we have not yet adapted to and reaching that level of nuclear level where it's a seamlessly level of where mankind can essentially be obliterated? Yeah, it's a, I mean, the parallel to China is always uh, something that I think lurks in the back of people's minds. When the INF Treaty, the Trump administration decided to finally leave the INF Treaty, uh, a lot of the, you know, flurry of what was published afterwards was, great, now we can station missiles all across Asia to counter the Chinese. I have so many reservations about that as a policy prescription, but uh, you can sort of see how people very seamlessly exported the lessons of the Euro missiles to the current confrontation or simmering confrontation, however we want to describe it, with uh, the People's Republic of China. I think on, on the broader macro question of whether or not we are in a new Cold War, the Cold War is not the only time we ever have had great power competition in international politics. And I think we're sort of obsessed for maybe generational reasons, maybe because we like the way we think the analogy applies of the Cold War, but we sort of gravitate towards that analogy when there are any number of other types of great power competition that we might look to uh, as an analogy, right? Uh, and so I'm always reticent to gravitate towards the new Cold War framework because I think a lot of Americans in particular do it because they assume that we will play the role of the United States again and China will be the Soviet Union. And so there's a sort of security blanket comforting thing about telling the story that way. I think we're looking at great power competition, of course, but I think there are so many different things. So much of what made the Cold War what it was, was about the totality of the competition, right? That you have competing systems, competing visions of modernization. You also have traditional hard power struggle over security and influence. I'm not sure that there is obviously an ideological component to what we're looking at in competition with China. But I don't think that we're yet at the point where we're looking at, you know, two competing visions of modernity that are necessarily having similar uh, appeal. So I, I think it can be helpful to use the Cold War as an analogy, but only as a device to help us think through and diagnose what we're seeing today. Um, in terms of the integrated deterrence question, I have no clue what integrated deterrence is. I think I'm a pretty smart person, and I thought about deterrence a lot. It is a catch-all term to mean many things to many people. And I, I think the biggest lesson I took away from writing this book is that sometimes those catch-all terms serve an incredibly valuable political purpose, right? It's because it can mean 20 things at once. So I, I, I don't expect that we will stop here in the red integrated deterrence, but I think that you could ask 20 people about what an integrated deterrence is and you'll get 40 different answers. Thank you. 
for the questions. Hi, um, this is kind of related to um, Dr. Gavin's last question, but I um, was wondering in writing the book, um, did you, what, if any, were, did you find to be the residual effects of this period on NATO? Maybe that have lasted until now. So does that make sense? Yeah. I think that there, because of the way that this story ends, there is a degree of myth-making that results about how stable NATO is. I think one of the biggest puzzles that any historian of NATO deals with is there is always this fundamental tension at the center where you have an alliance that is the most successful alliance in history, the most enduring alliance in history, perhaps not even an alliance because maybe it doesn't conform to any of the things. It's certainly not an alliance that William Lanner would have written about as a fixture of the 1870s or 1880s of this wealthy in order, right? It's totally different. But it's also always going to fall apart. It is on the brink of disaster every day. Take a day of the week, someone somewhere is going to tell you, NATO is going to fall apart. It's a shambles. It's a wreck. The allies are divided. And so there is this tension. How do you then decide what crises are real and matter and consequential and which ones are just a flash in the pan, which ones are passing problems that we're never going to potentially manifest into something? And so you have a situation where, and you're, it's, it's counterfactual. The alliance hasn't fallen apart. And so you're trying to figure out how close to that 50-50 point was it, knowing how it turned out. It's a really uh, difficult puzzle. But I think what has ended up happening is that people have a remarkable degree of confidence in NATO staying power, right? Uh, it's like chicken little, right? You say the sky is falling so many times that one day the sky is going to fall and everybody's going to go but it didn't fall the last 99 times. And so one of, the, one of the puzzles that I found writing the book was how do you explain that alongside another phenomenon, nuclear war, that has exactly the same kind of project, right? You hope this is gonna be one of the 99 times it doesn't happen, but what if you're wrong? And so you have those two senses of uncertainty that are deeply related, but kind of run in parallel through the book. Questions. Um, so, something that you do in your book, um, based on the, the parts of it that I've read so far, sorry. Um, <laughs> you can read uh, any parts, you don't have to apologize. I'm <laughs> it's been out for 24 hours. I yeah. <laughs> got <laughs> <laughs> off signage right now. You're doing pretty well. Um, so, something you do is, right, so as you, have you talked about it tonight as well, integrating the, um, the issues of domestic politics and many of the, of the member states into this broader story about NATO, um, obviously another um, historian stereotype of rejecting monocausal um, analyses. Um, but so how, I guess like the question is more about craft here, but so how do you, you know, how do you pick which domestic political issue is important enough to bring into this narrative as that you tell um, about NATO here? Um, and right, like how and how do we resist the urge to go into like a weird rabbit hole of saying that like turns out all these things about missiles was about pork barreling for Bavaria, right? Like you know, like how do we or, or whatever mess is going on in Italy on any given day of the week, right? Um, so yeah, how, how do you do that as a as an international historian deciding, right? Like obviously we all can't be experts on the coalition coalitional politics of you know. Holland, for example, as much as we might be about West Germany, or you know, I could yeah. spend a decade trying to figure out Belgium's politics. I still <laughs> have not made any progress. It's a so, great question. It, it's a great question. I, I think uh, so. My doctoral supervisor, Bob Bachwell, uh, the one piece of craft that he ever wanted to give me was, you are going to be really broad with no depth if you're a good international historian, right? You want to talk about a lot, and the cost of that is you can only go so deep. Right? That's just the trade-off that we make in being international historians. Um, and, and so in some it's ways- It's more like the definition of a political scientist. It's really narrow. Narrow. And so you, you have, 
Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> The old school political. <laughs> new generation. Uh, so, so, I mean, the, the honest answer though is a lot of trial and error. I wrote, there's probably five different versions of this book on my computer, right? You can endlessly be putting them in different orders, including different countries, excluding different countries. One of the biggest things that I wanted to do was tell a story that was not just about the big four. Uh, definitely not just about the United States, but, but not about the big four. So by that, I mean the United States, France, uh, West Germany, and the United Kingdom. And so it mattered to me that I had Belgium. I'm, I'm Canadian. Maybe this is just like a function of my middle tower anxiety. But I you know, wanted there to be Canadians and Italians and Belgians and Dutch. And middle tower anxiety. Right. I have a more title, right? And so, I, so part of it was that methodologically, I think not a lot of histories of native do that. And so that was just something that I cared a lot about and, and wanted to craft a narrative. Uh, around that. Um, in terms of actually wrangling it into a narrative, the biggest thing for me, I, I guess I sort of had a decision tree, which was that much as I wanted to treat everyone's domestic politics, the West Germans were more important than everyone else. And I wanted the book to make clear that the places that mattered the most, a, a, a sort of subtext of the book, I guess, is that I really don't think that NATO is an alliance in the Cold War led by the United States. I think it is an alliance led by the negotiation between the United States and the Federal Republic of Germany. And, mm -hmm. and everyone liked a story where it was about US leadership because nobody wanted to talk about West German leadership. And so it was convenient, a convenient fiction to have it be entirely about the United States. So my decision tree was West German politics needed to be there. After that, uh, it was really about trying to capture illustrative episodes that helped explain just how complicated the issue was without letting the narrative get away from me. So I could have written probably a lot more about Italian politics. Uh, some of that is source-based material. Uh, the Italian archives are not open basically after 1960. I have a few documents that uh, our good colleague, Paul Donuti, has gotten uh, out of uh, the Andreotti papers and some of them have even been translated into English by the Wilson Center. Uh, but, you know, I, I was limited in what I could do there. Uh, and so, but it, but it really was, I mean, I, the last thing I'll say on the craft side is I got to a point, Simon can attest, that I um, was so frustrated when I was doing the final version of the manuscript, but I put a post-it note on my computer that said, it is not an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> because it is so easy especially when you want to write a book that is a single history of an issue, you know that there's going to be someone out there who goes, you didn't talk about the time Henry Kissinger gave the speech in 1979. I can't believe it. It was so important. And you just have to be like, it's not the story I'm trying to tell. Um, and so, but so there is a commitment thing about saying, this is the story I'm going to tell. And then here is the evidence that best puts that, that case across. Um, and that is just a lot of trial and error. It was totally good for 75 minutes. I believe there... this is actually, we've got it over. All um, right, well, before... my, we're historians. If we go over three minutes, you should consider yourself. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you so much. This was this book is absolutely terrific. Uh, you should go out and buy it. I, uh, outside. Well, buy it outside, <laughs> uh, especially when you get the um, author's autograph. And so please uh, join me in the... Um, Thank you, well, Dr. Be for before uh, we, we we thank both uh, Dr. Gavin and <laughs> Dr. Colburn, um, uh, we have a little uh, party favor, no, <laughs> um, a token of our appreciation for joining us here at uh, AGM this, this evening for both of you. Uh, the all important. <laughs> Does that have a big picture, Peter, of it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> AGS T-shirt where you we hope to, to see you wearing this in archives all over the world. There <laughs> <laughs> we go. But join me in thanking both. <laughs>